in a world where everyone knows everything. <laughs> yeah, right. One dad stands below everyone and yells, I know nothing. Please welcome. Please welcome. This is the Dad Who Knows Nothing podcast. Well, hey, everybody. It's the Dad Who Knows Nothing podcast. Today, very excited to have Lindsay Neural. Now, Lindsay's a working mother of six, and she's homeschooled her own children for years. And she even wrote a book about it uh, called Homeschool Hacks, How to Give Your Kids a Great Education Without Losing Your Job or Your Mind which is just a fantastic title. And I wanted to get her on this podcast because I think homeschooling for a long time has been maybe a taboo. You know, people don't want to talk about it too much, but with the events of the last couple of years, I think it's something that's a viable option that a lot of uh, parents are looking for. I personally have done that with one of my children. And so I thought Lindsay would be a great person to come on and, and talk about homeschooling because of the success that she's had and all the tips and tricks that she provides. So Lindsay, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm excited to chat with you today. All right. So homeschooling, what would you say, what are some of the myths that still may exist around homeschooling, even though many were kind of forced to do at least a form of homeschooling at some point over the last couple of years? What what are still some of those myths that uh, you face as you help parents make this decision? Well, it's amazing that we still have to say the same things over and over. Um, but the the biggest one is that because it has the word home in it, that the children never leave the home or that everything has to happen in the home, or that there's somehow um, lack of socialization, which I suppose could happen, but it's rarely the case. Uh, homeschoolers are some of the most overscheduled <laughs> and uh, most goal-oriented people I know. So they usually have a lot of activities scheduled for their kids um, with the various you know, people in the community, different age groups, just they get a lot of really varied experiences. And then the other thing is that parents have to be the primary educator. And while we take responsibility as the primary educator, um, we do not necessarily have to do the teaching. So I'm here right now talking to you and my son is learning chemistry from a vetted, very experienced chemistry instructor um, who's teaching him virtually right now. And um, that is somebody that I have given that authority to and is the best person for the job. And so I don't have to worry about learning chemistry so that I can teach it to my child. And he doesn't lack any of the opportunity as far as education um, because he's homeschooled. Yeah, those are two that, like you said, those are two myths that have existed for a while. And uh, I actually homeschooled uh, for a couple years in high school. Uh, there's also that myth there that it somehow keeps them from being prepared to go on to college. Uh, but how have you how have you seen that with your own children? Oh, well, exactly the opposite. And again, this most homeschooling problems are parenting problems, right? So if your child is not um, ready to meet the world, it's a parenting issue more so than homeschooling. Um, and, and that certainly does happen. But with my firstborn, when she went off to college, she was actually pretty amazed at the lack of autonomy um, that other peers, I guess, had at, that they were kind of waiting for like permission to do things, waiting for the next direction, the next step, um, whereas she had been learning kind of independently and taking responsibility for her own chores and um, scheduling of her work throughout the day. So college, she just kind of slid right in. Um, it was a, it was a good next step for her because she had been kind of taking personal responsibility for work and and social activities in school. And it was it was a natural next step versus I think sometimes when you're in a classroom waiting for the teacher to tell you, yes, you may get up and use the bathroom. Um, it's weird then to get into college where you have to make those decisions on your own. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that's the one thing that I, uh, the one thing that I found when I homeschooled for a couple of years in high school was the fact that there's a lot of time that is kind of wasted in regular school, right? Because you're, you know, in between the different classes, you know, you have a little bit of time to settle down there. It takes a little while. The amount of homeschooling, uh, not homeschooling, but the amount of uh, uh, study halls that these kids have. My daughter has had like, 
two the same day once uh, last year. And it's like, well, that's like, that's like 45 to minutes to an hour of what, what are you doing? You know, so you, they can learn those types of things to be autonomous during that period. But you're right in homeschooling, it's kind of their show, right? And they're, they're helping to uh, drive that, that, that car down the street much sooner, I think. Yeah. So when you're talking about homeschooling, so what would a parent need to do? Let's say for whatever reasons they've come up at, as a family, they've decided how that they want to homeschool. How do they get started homeschooling today? Well, um, first of all, you have to research what's legal in the state that you live in. Um, and I always direct people to the homeschool legal defense website, just because they have even have a YouTube channel for all 50 states where you can quickly check on your state and see, okay, what's the first thing that I need to do? Um, because you obviously want to make sure you're complying. Um, and there's all sorts of rules and regulations differentiating. Um, we live in a pretty lax, I guess, for a better word, state where, yes, I have to file paperwork, but then the onus is on me to make sure my children get educated. No one's following up. Um, but once that's done, and sometimes even before, um, you can actually start taking that time to get to know your child um, because if they've been in school for some time, you may not even know um, where they're kind of at. Um, and I think that's kind of the biggest struggle for parents when they start out is they think, okay, my child's in third grade, we're going to get a third grade math curriculum and we're going to hit the ground running. And then you find out wow, you know, maybe they're a little behind in this area or they've been bored in school and this is way beneath what they could be doing um, performance wise. And so I tell parents to pick one subject where they know they don't have to try to assess where their child is at. So a literature based program might be a good one or science um, and just start in, just start in one subject, kind of get a feel for when your child is most productive during the day. Um, when they have the most energy, whether they're more like an online personality or they like to do textbooks or uh, experiential kind of um, activities and just kind of get a feel for your child. Because for a lot of parents, you don't really maybe know how they learn um, and picking one subject that's not quite so uh, stringent as far as placing in the correct, you know, grade level or um, competency level can give you a little freedom to figure that out. Um, and then start adding in uh, the other subjects kind of one at a time as you start to kind of figure out how your child is is best suited to learn. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, we we have to be able to identify where their strengths and weaknesses are so that you can support them where needed. I'm sure there will be some subjects and you've probably seen this with your kids that they need very little supervision. They can take it and run with it. They like the subject or they're very good at it or it comes easy to them. Whereas others, you know, a little bit more supports needed uh, from the parenting side. Definitely. And, you know, there's going to be things I just don't like. And um, again, parenting, right? Parenting versus homeschooling. Um, it's like getting your kid to eat their vegetables. At some point, you, you just have to say, OK, this you've got to do math or you've got to, you know, got to get it done. <laughs> yeah. And at some point as a parent, you could probably be the one to tell them, hey, look, this uh this particular type of algebra, there's a probably a good chance you will never use that, you know, in your job, but it's something that you you need to know so you can at least understand. And the reality is, is that the educational system, if it does its job, it's just teaching a child how to learn, right? And to continue to learn. And that's what we want for our kids. We just want them to enter the world, not thinking that they know it all, but not thinking that they know nothing and still and wanting to learn and continue learning. So Definitely. very cool. So you gave the example of you have a chemistry professor or teacher that's helping your son right now. That sounds like that might be a little costly. How, how do you do that? How do you do homeschooling if, if you're on a tight budget? How does that work? Yeah. So I remind parents that with anything, um, you have kind of like the three legged stool. You can have good, cheap fast or good, cheap, easy, right? Well, good is non-negotiable because that's why we're homeschooling, right? Because we want our child to have a good education. Then you have to kind of balance between cheap and easy. And as a working parent, I've decided that there are certain subjects or certain activities that I'm willing to spend some money on to make it easy for me to be here today, to talk to you, um, to work with my clients, to do the things I need to do 
put the food on the table. Um, for someone that maybe has a little more time but has less budget, um, they're going to want to do more of the DIY, checking out books from the library and getting used curriculum and going through and maybe teaching some of those things themselves. But there are plenty of low cost and free resources um, for even parents who don't want to teach chemistry. You know, Khan Academy website online has the majority of courses that a child would need for a well-balanced education, at least as a starting point. Um, and then you could support that with uh, co-ops from your homeschool community or um, MOOCs, M-O-O-C, you know, those ma those online courses from different colleges that they can attend or audit for free and kind of see what's available there. And one thing that's been really interesting this year is I've seen several of the community colleges and even some private liberal, or liberal arts schools are giving dual enrollment um, classes to rising juniors and seniors for free. So whereas normally um, you maybe would get half price tuition, they're really trying to get that next generation of college student in. And they found that a good way to do that is to kind of court them with free college credits. So I would definitely be looking into some of those as a free or very low cost way to get some high school credits knocked out. Nice. And there's definitely a, a ton of options out there for programs. Uh, to your point, there's complete programs that you can buy and it's the whole thing in a package for that particular year. And then there's probably pick and choose type things. So it sounds like you probably do a little bit more a la carte, depending on the subject, uh, picking and choosing what you, what you need and what's best for your child. Yeah, my children have very, you know, we started out when they were younger saying, okay, you're really close in age, we're going to do classes together. And you soon, soon figure out one kid's just excelling, the other kid's kind of taking their time. And you're like, okay, we chose to homeschool for individualized education. So if I'm holding one back or trying to push one along, it kind of defeats the purpose. So so now we really look at each child starting in about sixth grade and we say, OK, you can't stop reading science articles and watching science YouTube videos all day long. You're geared towards science. What kind of courses are we going to need to give you so that you feel fulfilled and can kind of figure out what your next steps are going to be versus the kid that's really into philosophy and art and um, logic, you know, that's a that's a different kid. So um, you figure these things out as you spend more time with them and you see what they're spending their free time on. Wow, so that's a lot that we've talked about considerations, if, especially if you have multiple kids, how to do it and how to make it so each of them are, are set up to succeed. How can anyone do this and work full time at the same time? Well, you know, um, we started when they were very young so they've always known kind of how to grow up in that. And I admit it's a lot harder if you have a large family and you're pulling all your kids. Um, and now you have five kids at home that don't know how to homeschool. You're going to have a bit of a learning curve. But I think as children are kind of given time and tools to figure things out on their own, they get more used to, like you said, learning how to learn. Um, they'll oftentimes come to me with things that they've found that are interesting or things that their friends are doing that they think is interesting. And they kind of get a little bit more of, I guess, a responsibility for their own education. Really though, from first grade to about sixth grade, my kids all had the same basic education. You know, they read the same books. They went through the same kind of math series. They might have done it a year ahead or a year behind, or one kid might have taken them two years to finish the math. One kid might have done it in four months. But the sequence um, has been pretty much the same. It's when they get to junior high and high school that just like sports, you know, you have a kid that wants to play football and a kid that wants to play cello. How do you come to that decision? Well, it's the same as a public schooler. You ask them what they're interested in. You kind of follow their interests and you figure out what programs are going to meet those needs. Got it. So. A lot of what is being used today for homeschooling programs, and we saw this during the pandemic when a lot of schools shifted right to uh, doing distance learning, doing learnings through Zoom classes, Zoom fatigue. You mentioned uh, YouTube videos that sh that a child may like in a particular subject area. But then there's this flip side of how much screen time is too much? How much is it? If my kid's on Zoom all day long for class or 
you know, some type of screen to learn, and then they want to be on for fun. I mean, you're talking maybe 10 hours a day that they're on screen. How do we balance that as parents understanding that a lot of their education, if they're homeschooled, may be through that medium? Definitely. And that is a very tight balance that um, I think daily, I know my husband and I are are constantly like, oh, we have to dial this back a little bit because you're right. Um, Peer groups interact digitally. Um, Even their friends that live 20 minutes away that we see daily, you know, they're on Discord or they're playing video games together. And that is just, that's the new version of me taking the telephone all the way into the hallway with the big long cord, right? Growing up and talking to my friends for hours. So this screen time is also their their social time. And so you kind of do have to put that into buckets and say, okay, if I know my child needs an hour of peer time and they want to play video games and they're going to spend two hours maybe with math and chemistry, do we want to look towards a literature course that's completely offline? Um, but that's the reason why I kind of go away from eBooks and audiobooks and try to make my children read actual physical tangible books because that is time away from the screen. But I think there's ebb and flow and your family may have more strict guidelines as to screen time than you know I do. Definitely a consideration though, when you're picking curriculum. Some kids just do not like online curriculum and we've responded to that by pulling them away from some of that. Um, I will say you will not spend seven hours on Zoom if you're homeschooling, you better not be. Something isn't going right there um, because I think most kids need at maximum four hours of actual instruction time. Um, and that's in the high school. So if your kid's on there for longer, maybe you need to like get rid of a couple subjects and school through the summer or spread things out a little bit more because of that, that does feel like a lot. Yeah, that's a great point. All right. So we talked about at the beginning, we talked about a couple of the myths and one of them was around socialization. So how do we make sure that our homeschooled children get enough socialization and make friends. And again, maybe that was much more difficult over the last two and a half years, but in general, what are some good tips for doing that? Well, I can't think of a, of a community and I'm from a very small rural community where we're the only family that homeschools in our community, but just 15 minutes away, they're like 20 families and they have a Facebook group and they're constantly saying, hey, let's go to all go to the museum together or let's do a picnic or we're going to do a park day or we're going to have a speaker come in. So I think all you have to do is hop on Facebook and see that um, there are groups that do this. That's all they do is they come together and come up with opportunities for children to get together and socialize and learn together. So really, I think if a kid isn't getting socialization, again, this is a parenting problem. Um, not a homeschool problem necessarily, because now that things are opened up, um, there's just so much going on. The other thing is, you know, when school is not in session for the summer, do you worry? And this is kind of what I tell people who challenge the homeschool concept. You know, do you worry about your child not being getting socialized during the summer when school's closed? Well, of course not. They're going to the pool and they're going with their friends to the park and they're getting together for this and they're getting together for that. And I'm asking the parents, are you shuttling them around or doing all that stuff? You know, how, how do you come into that picture? Oh, well, they'll take them to sports or they'll take them to this. So I guess if kids don't die from lack of socialization during the summer, which is often when they have the most freedom to socialize, they're certainly not going to die from lack of socialization during homeschooling, which to us, is just kind of like one big long summer. So I, I don't, <laughs> I don't feel that school is the only way to get it done. And, and we've seen with the homeschool groups, Um, We have alternate proms. We have like all sorts of things now. Um, There's just really no excuse uh, for the socialization myth. Yeah, it's 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 the deaf. It's the question for parents. Are you homeschooling them to try and make it easier on yourself? Or are you homeschooling them to get the best benefit that they can get in that setup so that they can have tailored work that they're doing for their interests and things that they enjoy. And if parents are coming at it from that direction, then they're going to, they're going to naturally be looking out for all of these other things that maybe may not come as easily as it would in a school setting, 
but can still be done pretty simply if they just focus and make sure they they pay attention to it. Definitely. And, you know, schools change. Like we don't even have busing services in a lot of the schools anymore. Right. Exactly. So it's, it's not like you can drop your kid off at the bus stop and then all their activities are planned for the whole day. Parents are still spending a ridiculous amount of time shuttling their kids and attending PTA meetings and doing this and doing that and volunteering. And when you think of all the time a parent spends being part of that school system, you're already investing a lot of time. So I think we're ready for this. We just, um, don't realize maybe all the hours we were already investing. Yeah. The joke was that uh, we should just get a bus when they get to a certain age, because that's what we feel like, right. We're just uh, (laughs) transporting them to different uh, functions and different activities. Yeah. And I think too, that there is much more awareness and acceptance of somebody's schedule that may have kids that are being homeschooled, right. In today's in today's remote work where everybody wants remote work and obviously they're not everybody has the the opportunity to work remotely, but there's an acceptance of if there is remote work, you know, there's probably going to be somebody at home that needs to be taken care of, whether it's a child or an aging parent or something like that. So it definitely provides a little bit more of an opportunity for their acceptance, you know, to take certain times during the day to make sure that the child has what they need to uh, continue to succeed in in their homeschooling program. Definitely. All right. I I have all girls and I know you have some boys. So any special considerations, homeschooling girls versus boys? What have you you found? I don't, I don't know. I I just know that (laughs) we have low energy and high energy kids. And I think that might be a better description. Um, Mm. I had a very high energy girl um, and a couple low energy boys. And I I feel like the only real difference is when they have that energy. So really one of the great things is that when kids are that high energy and they don't want to sit still and they want to get, you know, working on stuff, that's a great time to get them into really hands-on type learning versus low energy, you know, sit and read and, and kind of do the more passive learning. Um, I just know our boys, our boys are a lot. And I know that if I wasn't, wasn't home with them, I'd be missing out on just so much. And it's one of the best parts about homeschooling is just getting to know these guys. And it makes you really have kind of hope for the future. I think a lot of the things we see on the news is look how terrible these kids are um, coming out of schools and all the problems. And I think when you homeschool and you get to spend time with your kids, you change your perspective on the world. It's good for kids, but it's also really good for parents. Nice. Well said. So tell me about the book. Yeah. So the book was uh, eight years ago, I wrote a homeschool book and no one wanted to hear about it. And uh, (laughs) the pandemic came along and I asked an agent, you know, do you think this is something people would be interested in? And he said, yeah. So Simon and Schuster put it out last year. Um, just in time for some parents to be home and not knowing what to do. We kind of wondered if homeschooling was going to be sticking around. And I think we're seeing it's here for a lot of families for the long term. And I think it's great. So yeah, the book is just some, if you needed to get started on Monday, what do I need to know? And then interviewing a lot of families from different lifestyles, because what you're going to need to do as a military family is a lot different than what I'm going to need to do as a small business owner. And so we kind of share what a day in the life looks like and schedules and different curriculum options. So that maybe you see yourself in some of those stories and think, yeah, I can do this. Nice. So can you give us one hack off the top of your head that can kind of whet my audience's appetite to go read more? Sure. So this seems like a no brainer, but we don't do it often enough. And that is up until our kids are about 13, we read to them at night before they go to bed. Mm. And it seems like once a kid learns how to read themselves, you wouldn't do bedtime stories. But the great thing about reading to kids at night is you can kind of knock out a lot of the books on the list Mm. that kids need to learn to get a great literature background. And I'm reading books that I just don't remember growing up that are pretty amazing. So I'm getting to mark them off of my Goodreads list as well. Um, And then it's just kind of a special bonding time. My husband has read to our children every night 
since they were born. Um, mm. And when he goes out of town, I take over and now I'm reading to them. And it's just something we've always done. And when you look back at the big long list of books over 20 years of marriage, um, our kids have gotten a lot of literature and it all counts. It all counts as an education. So that's my tip. That's great. That's something that I do with my five-year-old. We switch off every other night. It's me or my wife. <clears throat> and, you know, you're, you're, it's, it also leads to good conversations too, because they'll ask questions. It'll put them in a very calm place where they feel confident to ask questions and safe spot. You know, it's, it's story time with mom or dad. So yeah, that's a great hack. And not only if you're homeschooling, but for any parents with their kids, that's a great thing to do. Very cool. Yeah. And if you think about consistency, we haven't had a lot of consistency over the last couple of years, but everybody goes to sleep at the end of the day. <clears throat> yep. So no matter when you wake up, no matter how crazy your day is, no matter what's going on in the world, everyone goes to sleep. And so if you can just have one family tradition that you tie to the one thing that never changes, it gives your child like one little tiny grain of consistency and stability that I think can really set them up for success later. Yeah, absolutely. So can you give me an example of a great book that you uh, were able to read? Well, we read Charlotte's Web. Oh, nice. Perfect. <laughs> it has some of the most amazing. Um, it's one of the most amazing books ever. But also I have to like prepare myself. If I know I'm in a bad place and I can't read the ending, I will mm -hmm. stretch it out or we're only going to do a couple minutes because when that ending comes, you know, yeah. <laughs> and then be prepared to talk about it for a long time with right. those kids, like you mentioned. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we haven't progressed yet to like chapter books or longer books. We're we're pretty much just the the story books that can be read in one quick setting before bed. But uh, I do think that's the next step is to get to some of those chapter books like Charlotte's Web, because I think that it's kind of like it hooks all of us right when we're talking about like netflix episodes yeah. or show episodes where we next week another one's coming out i'm so excited well i mean every day it can it can draw the the child into what's happening next so very cool it is it, it, eternal cliffhangers it's one of the one of the things that gets the kids into bed too so there's your your added perk there <laughs> yeah there you go no very good all right well lindsay this has been very cool to talk to you. This is a great subject that I think is becoming more and more accepted and more and more thing, uh, something that parents are more willing to tackle and with good benefits. And I think all the programs that are out there, all the support groups, all those things, and certainly things like your book, it can provide everyone with the support and answers, tips and tricks that they can all use to hopefully tailor this so that it's not just, oh yeah, my kid's homeschooled. It's my kid is homeschooled. He got the best education for him and he really excelled at it. And now he's off of college. Now he's at uh, moving on and in and, and the workforce and doing really well. And that's really the story that we want to tell as parents. So if, if you could leave my audience with one last thing, what would it be? Um, just that if you don't see someone that looks like you, whether it's your work schedule or, you know, um, your lifestyle choices or, you know, even the ages and stages of kids, don't feel like that doesn't mean you're not meant to try homeschooling. Um, get online, look for people that look like you, um, and maybe you're going to be the first in your community, but then someone will look to you for inspiration. Um, we're just, we're all learning as we go. So don't put too much pressure on yourself. <laughs> Well said, Lindsay. Well, she's a mom of six. She's been homeschooling since 2004 before it really became what I would say something that everybody had to do. She's been doing it well. She's been excelling. Her tips and tricks have been seen in different publications. And she wrote a book, Homeschool Hacks, How to Give Your Kids a Great Education Without Losing Your Job or Sometimes Your Mind or Sometimes Both. So uh, very good tips and tricks in that book. I'll make sure to put those in the show notes so that everybody knows where they can find that. Uh, thank you very much, Lindsay, for your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on our journey to learn about various topics. If you'd like to get in touch with the dad who knows nothing, connect with him at the dad who knows nothing on TikTok and Instagram or dad knows zero on Twitter. If you have a moment and you like this episode, drop us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Have a great day and enjoy your journey through this game called life.